Good morning. If you would, open your Bibles up with me to Genesis 27. We're starting to talk about or, or to see the downfall of a family. Um, really, the busting apart of something really great and how it happened. And I think we can learn much about family dynamics and success generationally, uh, maybe from this chapter, what not to do. However, what we're going to see is that none of this is going to stop God's plan from going forward. God has chosen Abraham. God then chose Isaac. And now God is choosing Jacob. And does that mean that Abraham was a perfect person? Clearly not. Did this mean that Isaac was a perfect person? Clearly not. And we're going to see Jacob also, not a perfect person. But sinful men coming into contact with Holy God and having a covenant relationship with Yahweh. Uh, amazing stuff to look at. Uh, this chapter has been described by some as first a masterpiece when you take the master out, all you're left with are the pieces. And it's fairly disturbing. What's the, 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 the heading on this chapter is Jacob's deception, but it should be every member of the family acting in the flesh. Uh, if we go back to James chapter 3, we've gone here several times. But I think it's worth noting again in James chapter 3, verse 13, it says this, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. As we come back to Genesis 27, we find every member of the family acting in envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition. Even the ones that are believing what God has said, they're still trying to work it out in the flesh. If God said that the youngest child was going to be the one that the blessed seed was going to come through, then nobody has to work that out for God. Nobody has to manipulate behind the scenes. What we're going to see is that God's plan is going to be carried out. Yet the, the pain that is caused by God's chosen people operating in the flesh is just hard to really look at. If you have not um, read chapter 27, I want you to read it, and I want you to think about this one saying. Um, Dr. William Culbertson, who was president of the Moody Bible Institute, uh, used to pray this. Lord, help us to end well. Boy, that's my prayer. Um, with everything that has gone on this year, even with the events that happened with the great Bible teacher, Ravi Zacharias, and what came out after his death. Maybe I, in, in my lifetime, there has probably not been someone who has impacted me more positively for the gospel of Jesus Christ than Ravi Zacharias. And then for the events to come out after his death, oh, is painful. And 
As we read this chapter, we're going to see that Isaac was a son of the promise. Sought God for a wife, God gave him a wife. Sought God for children, God gave him children. And then we see at the end, him totally blowing it. Yet, even in him totally blowing it, God's plan still is marching forward. Did God use Isaac? Yes. But, but Isaac caused a lot of needless pain. For himself and for his whole family and generations that follow. Remember, the sins of the father extend to the third and the fourth generation. If we don't get these things right, they will generationally come back up. So take some time right now and read chapter 25 and then we'll pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the reminder that you're God and, and we're not. And Father, thank you for the assurance that your plan is going to move forward. It's not contingent on us. However, if we want to know happiness and prosperity and security and peace and rest, we're, we're going to find it in you, in your plan, not in our own. So, Father, with this in mind, may we renew our mind with the truth today. And may we seek you. And, Father, may we end well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the end of chapter 26, we see that Esau has married, not according to God's plan, he has married more than one wife, and... He has married women uh, from the Canaanites. Um, now, what we're going to find is that Jacob also marries two women. It could arguably be said that he marries four women. But we're going to see that every time we disobey God, it's going to bring pain into our lives. Yet, Right from the end of chapter 25, we have seen that Jacob has a desire for spiritual things. Esau does not. And we're going to see that even lend itself more. When I was a child, I remember hearing about the story of Jacob and Esau. And it was put forth that Esau did not love the Lord and that Jacob did. There may be a sliver of truth in that, but... Up to this point, it's clear that Esau does not know God and that he never really does get to know God. And also we can say that at this point, Jacob does not know God. That will come in the later chapters when God confronts him. The, disturb the most disturbing part of this chapter is not Jacob's deception, but it is the 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 scheming of both Isaac and Rebekah, both of which have had contact with God. And it, it doesn't seem to impact them, at least at the present. We see Isaac basically saying, if it feels good, that's the way I'm going to live. We also see Rebecca basically saying the ends justify the means. Um, it says, now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son and he said to him, my son. And he said, here I am. Isaac said, behold, now I am old and I am I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love. And bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. There's a lot here. You would think that when one comes to the end of their life, that they would start to focus on the fact that they're going to have to stand before God. 
But what we find, not just in Isaac's situation, but in many situations, we find that the true priorities of our life come out at the end. Maybe we have done well to cover them up to that point. What do we find is most important to eat to Isaac? Is it the word of the Lord? No, it's his lust of the flesh, what he wants to eat. We're going to see this over and over again, that Isaac is controlled by his body, not by what the Lord has said. Go back to chapter 25, verse 19 through 23, We've already read it a few times. But God has told Rebecca and Isaac in no uncertain terms that God is going to bless Jacob. Now the blessing that is promised here in verse 4 is the blessing that goes along with the birthright. With the birthright comes along the material blessing. And so the spiritual and the physical would be coupled together. We've already talked about that at great length. Now, whether it would appear that Isaac would have known that his sons had this deal about their birthright, but let's say that maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't know that uh, Esau has rejected leadership, spiritual leadership of the family. But he also sees that Esau has just gone out and married two Canaanite women, and it, it says it brought great grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Yet none of that seems to matter to Isaac. He's coming to the end of his life, and we, we find that he lives quite a lot longer than this, though. Um, he comes to the end of his life, and he's focused on himself. He is in object rebellion against God's command. Why? Why would he choose to rebel against God? I think you can go back to chapter 25, verse 28, because he played favorites. He loved Esau more than he loved Jacob. And so therefore, he chose Esau. And Jacob is whom God chose. Why? I don't know, but from the last chapter, we can see that Esau was much more like Abraham. And I think that Isaac was way more passive and non-confrontational, but he admired that about Esau. He wanted that to be what he was, but he wasn't. I think that we can see that Isaac is as many fathers do, trying to live out their own desires through their son. When in reality, Isaac was much more like Jacob than he wanted to admit. He lived not by faith. We see aspects of faith in his life, and he's in the hall of faith. Ultimately, he believed God and he had a covenant with God. But remember, the only stipulation was that he stay in the land. He lived mostly by his own senses, what we would call the lust of the flesh. He was controlled, not by God's word, but by his own body. Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to Esau. And now here we go again. Uh, we have her eavesdropping in, and we're going to see this several times in the text. What would have happened if Rebecca had respected her husband enough and loved God enough to step in and say, Esau, hold on. Isaac, you know this is wrong. What would have happened? But well, we, we don't find that to be happening. We don't know what happened between uh, chapter 26 and 27. Many years have passed. But somehow there's something dividing the relationship between the husband Isaac and the wife Rebecca. They're not on the same page. Something has happened. I think it has everything to do with them playing favorites. 
Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. She was listening while the deal was being made. And she knows that it's in rebellion against God. But here's the thing. If God has said it, it's going to happen. Does Rebecca have to go about deceiving and scheming to make it happen? And the answer is no. Uh, people have often said, well, wait a minute. God used, uh, when the, the spies went into the land of Canaan and, and Rahab hid them and she lied, God used that lie. Well, God worked despite her lies. What would have happened if she hadn't lied? Would, God, would God's plan still have been carried out? Yes. And we would have seen a, a greater manifestation of God. It says, so when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare savory dish for me that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, that's not exactly what he said. He, he did say, so that I may bless you before I die. And it appears that that's the blessing that comes along with the birthright. Verse 8, now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Now, I don't want you to be thinking that a Jacob is an 8-year-old boy here. He's not an 8-year-old boy. He's a 40-year-old man. How do you know that? Well, he's at least 40. Back up in chapter 26, verse 34, it says Esau was 40 years old. So they're not kids. He, he's to the point where he should be able to discern right from wrong. She's commanding her son, Now go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there that I may prepare as a savory dish for your father. Again, she knows what uh, her husband is controlled by. So she's give up on her husband spiritually leading the family. Now she's going to manipulate him through his lust of the flesh to get God's will accomplished. Let me say this again. God will never use lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life to accomplish his will. It's going to bring nothing but pain. Then you shall bring it to your father, that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Isaac is my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me. Then I will be a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. It appears as if Isaac is not really concerned about what is right, because if he was concerned about what was right, he would be a deceiver. And he knew, just like she knew, that he was controlled by his feelings. He's going to feel me, because he can't see. He's not concerned about what is right. He's worried about getting caught. Massive difference. When Jacob comes into contact with God, we're going to see that change. And I would say it always changes when someone comes into contact with God. His mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. Rebecca seems to be working under the cover of, I know what God says is going to happen, so I'm going to make it happen. Does she need to do that? The answer is clearly no. Yet she feels the need to take the reins, go outside of her role, and we're going to see the wreckage from it. 
So he went and got them, and he brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. If you can make goat taste like venison, you're an awesome cook. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her eldest son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son, and put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck, and also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. So, deceiving on every level. Then he came to his father and he said, My father. He said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, First lie, I am Esau, your firstborn. He is Jacob. First lie. Second lie. I have done as you told me. Second lie. Isaac hadn't told him anything. Get up, please. Sit and eat my game. Third lie. It wasn't his game. That you may bless me. That's what it's all about. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have it so quickly, my son? Fourth lie. Because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Wow! To turn and blame all of this on the Lord, does this not sound familiar? Echoing back to Adam? And then echoing all along the way. When it really push comes to shove, we want to blame God. Then, verse 21, Isaac said to Jacob, Please come close, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him, and he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Again, he's not living by the word of God. God has already told him to bless Jacob. But he is going by his own feelings, and he's going to bless Esau, he thinks. All of the rest of the deception in this chapter flows from Isaac, the father, the head, the spiritual leader, rebelling against God. Oh, what untold pain Isaac could have kept from happening to his family. He could have protected them from sin, but, but he doesn't. Feelings do not make good leaders. Feelings make good followers. God's word makes good lead. Verse. So Jacob came close to his father in verse 22. He felt him and he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. They were not hairy like his brother Esau. His mother had strapped goat hide to him. But don't miss the last four words. So he blessed him. And he said, Are you really my son Esau? Fifth lie. I am. So he said, Bring it to me, and I will eat my son's game, that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. He also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him. And he said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you of the dew of heaven 
and the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's son bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. This is an amazing rebellion against God when you think about the fact that Isaac thinks he's talking to Esau. An object rebellion against what God has already spoken. Why does all this happen when the father, when the husband refuses to take spiritual leadership of the family? That doesn't mean that the father and the husband gets to do whatever he wants to do. It means that he must have a walk with God and do what God tells him to do. Here, we find Isaac not doing that, and then it opens the door for his wife to rebel, for his children to rebel. Now it came about, verse 30, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in, from his hunting. That might have been an interesting interchange if they had met and Esau would have seen his brother dressed in his clothes with goat hide wrapped to his arms and his neck. Verse 31. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game so that you may bless me. If you think about the blessing that Isaac has just given to Jacob, you can understand why Esau wanted this blessing, but he didn't really care about the birthright. The birthright was focused on spiritual leadership, but the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob was about wealth and power. That's why Esau wants it. He wants wealth and power. He just doesn't want to be led by God. He said, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. He says, then Isaac trembled violently. Why? Why did he tremble violently? I believe that here is when God brings him face to face with his own rebellion. And he said, Who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me, so that I ate of all of it before you came, and then I blessed him? He knew. Yes, he says, and he shall be blessed. I think that's the key here. Yes, he will be blessed. God's will got done. But oh, the wreckage around it. Only what would have happened if Isaac had just submitted to God over his own feelings? When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. It doesn't seem as though Esau really gave a rip about his father and mother. I mean, he went out and married two Canaanite girls that brought them much. He didn't care about that. What's he care about? He cares about the money, and the power. He said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Again, we see what a great time if, if he was now going to submit to God. He's already seen up in, in, in verse 33 that God did this. This was God's plan and it's not going to be thwarted. 
he causes more problems. Instead of him saying, you know, I should have never said that I was going to bless you because God told us when you were babies uh, that your younger brother was going to be the one blessed. And so I acted in rebellion. Will you forgive me? He doesn't do that. He just, he, he plays on. Your brother came deceitfully. That was true. And he has taken away your blessing. That's not true. The blessing was never going to go to Esau. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? Heel grabber. For he has supplanted me these two times. That's not true either. He took away my birthright. He did not take away. There was a transaction that was not a valid transaction, as we have already said. You can't buy something that is, not, that is already yours, and you cannot sell something that is not yours. Not in a valid sense. He took away my birthright. He didn't have any desire for the birthright in the first place. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. So all the hatred, instead of being put in the right place, it was all focused on Jacob. Jacob has some culpability. But really, it's all about not wanting God's plan. And God's plan will not be thwarted. I want you to go back with me to Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, we've already talked about this, I think, once. Hebrews 12, 16, it talks about Esau. Look at verse 14. It says, Hebrews 12, 14. Um, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. There was some sort of root of bitterness between Isaac and Rebekah, and it caused much defilement. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Do you think that Esau was sorry that he sold his birthright to Jacob? I think yes. But it was not the sorrow that leads to repentance. It was the sorrow that leads to death. And we're going to see that mostly the death is focused on Jacob. Look over in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, in, in verse 20, it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Um, It's very hard to understand. It says, Jacob, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of his sons. Um, let's go back. You say, well, I know that he blessed Isaac. I mean, I, I know that Isaac blessed Jacob, but how did he bless Esau? Well, it's not really much of a blessing. Let's go back to Genesis and we'll see what he has said. He says, have you not reserved a blessing for me at the end of verse 36? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master. That's baloney. God has done this, not Isaac. And all his relatives I have given to him as servants. And with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept.
Then Isaac, his father, answered him and said to him, Here's the blessing. Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. Doesn't sound much like a blessing. Uh, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. This is talking about later on during the reign of David and Solomon. The country, the nation that came from Esau is called Edom. And during that time, the Edomites were under Israeli reign. But yet they broke free of that at the end when the kingdom split. We'll read more about that when we get to uh, Kings and Chronicles. Um, not much of a blessing there. Verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to him, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Well, it seems that it's coming true already. The sword is not going to leave him. And again, we talk about bitter envying and jealousy. Go back to James. We already read James chapter 3. Now go to James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that war, wage war against your members? You lust and you do not have. You commit murder. You're envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. What do we find? The first recourse for Esau is murder. God's not going to allow that to happen. But it's going to be a wedge of conflict between Jacob and Esau for the majority of their lives. Verse 42. Now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and she called her younger son Jacob and told him. Now we'll get to that in a minute. Does it not appear that Rebecca is much more the head of this family than Isaac. She is listening. She, people are reporting to her. And we know that Isaac at this point is very old and blind and bedridden. Uh, but not a good view here. And we, we don't see the Bible. Uh, in two times we see the Bible telling uh, women to be like Sarah. We never see any scripture telling Women to be like Rebecca. She said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. And would to God, a 40 plus year old man would have said at this point, Wait a minute. By obeying you the first time I got into this mess. But we don't see that. Obey my voice and arise, flee to Haran, to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days. Her plan, a few days. But we're going to find that he stays there decades. And he will never see his mother alive again on this earth. He says, stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Understanding that if Esau kills Jacob, then the law, Esau would be put to death. Lex talionis, eye for an eye. Go back to Noah. It says, verse 46, Rebekah said to Isaac. Now this is interesting. Again, this is the first time we see them actually talking to each other. I'm tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. Who are the daughters of Heth? The wives of Esau. I'm tired of living. 
If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Again, we see Rebecca relaying information to Isaac, not based on the Lord. Would God would want us to get a wife from people who believe in Yahweh, not from these Canaanite women. No, it's, it's only, she's only talking about herself and how this is affecting her. It's making me not want to live. And she's only appealing to his flesh because he doesn't appear to be able to operate in any other way. Warren Wearsby is the one that said, the family is a masterpiece. But in this chapter, you see, when the master is taken out of the masterpiece, all you're left with are the pieces. And we have the pieces, father, the wife, the two children, all being obliterated. As we end, I want us to be reminded in John 14, 6, Jesus, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but me. Truth is always God's way because that's inherently what his character is described as, truth. Uh, Satan operates much the opposite. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, Paul states this, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. God is truth, and he always uses truth. Satan always uses deception. That's why he's called the father of lies. God will never use Satan's tactics to accomplish his will. God's will would have been accomplished regardless. But because of Isaac and Rebekah and Esau and Jacob, all of them focused on the flesh, we see them all being caused countless pain and trouble. I'm thought of David, in his great sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 32, it is the repentant, the restoration psalm. It goes along with Psalm 51. This would be his psalm of repentance. Psalm 51 would be his psalm of restoration. It says this, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in what? And in whose spirit there is no deceit. We see deceit on Isaac's part. We see deceit on Rebekah's side. We see deceit on Esau's part, and we see deceit on Jacob's part. What a tragedy. When we try to manipulate life by deception, God can never be glorified. And in God not being glorified, we can never really have true happiness. Father, we love you. We pray that our lives will be about truth and not about deception. Father, when deception is part of our lives, show it to us quickly so we can confess it as sin and repent and get back to a right walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray.